Hi, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Glad you've come to watch us again, wherever you're watching from. We're in this series called Encounter because during this month we've been spending time really praying and actually this week fasting that we would have greater encounters with Jesus. Because let's face it, that's the thing we all need. Some of the other situations, problems, circumstances in our lives really can all be answered when we have a fresh encounter with Jesus. So we were looking over the last couple of weeks that an encounter with God just brings the actuality of God back into our walk with him. Sometimes we can all get in the motions of going through the footsteps of Christianity, but lose the very heart of it. You see, Jesus Christ is the very heart, the very heartbeat of Christianity. So when we have a fresh encounter with him, suddenly everything comes back into a place of being real again in a powerful way. And we shared in our last session concerning God wanting us to enjoy fresh bread. When we come to looking at encounters with Jesus, we can live off of previous encounters, but in many ways that's like eating stale bread or leftover bread. Now that's a shame when God wants us to be experiencing fresh bread. We read last week concerning how Jesus said of himself, I am the bread of heaven. I am the bread that's come down from heaven. And unlike the manna that the um, Israelites ate, this isn't just for natural needs. Rather, I satisfy you in every area of your life. Now I wanna look today, staying in the theme of encounter, at the thought of encounters with Jesus change your life. They really do. When I look at my life, I remember it was moments of encounters that changed my life. Not religion about him, not theology about him, encounters with him. I can remember the encounter I had with Jesus that caused me to walk away from the life that I was living and suddenly decide with my whole heart I was going to be a follower of Christ. But I also remember over the last 30 years plus, there were different moments where I encountered God in a fresh way. And each time I encountered God in a fresh way, it brought about an incredible change, a rerouting, a new way of thinking, a fresh way of understanding things. Now, when we look at Christianity, we have to always remember that Christianity was always meant and designed by God to be a relationship with God. It was never meant to be a religion about God. Now, not just a relationship, but the most important relationship in your life and in mine. What a privilege, what an honor that God has made a way for us to have a living and vibrant, life-changing relationship with him. Now, when we think of that, we have to ask ourselves, and why would anyone settle for a religion about him? Well, sometimes it's because people don't know that the heart of God, the love of God, is that he wants to walk with us, have fellowship with us, be a part of our daily lives. That he considered us now sons and daughters, not slaves or acquaintances. Isn't it wonderful that the Bible reveals that the plan of God out of a love for us, even when we were fallen, was to bring us back to being his sons and his daughters. Now, when we look through the Gospels, there is no shortage of examples. In fact, the Gospels are like a catalogue of example for us regarding how an encounter with Jesus will change your life. Let me just grab a couple of them today. And um, let's grab the man Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus? He was the short man that we read about in Luke 19. I'm not calling him short. That's what the Bible says of him. But he climbed a tree to encounter Jesus. He'd heard about Jesus, but he wanted to encounter Jesus for himself. Climbs a tree. Jesus walks past at that um, that specific moment, looks up and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. Then we read on in Luke 19 that Jesus goes to the house of Zacchaeus and you don't see Jesus preaching. You don't see him beating on Zacchaeus. You're a bad man. You're a thief. You're a robber. He's just eating with him. And that moment when Zacchaeus was in the presence of Jesus 
changed his life forever. Suddenly, when you read on, you see Zacchaeus jump up and say, I'm not going to live like I've lived anymore. I'm going to give back to those that I've stolen from. This incredible life change, yet we don't have any evidence that Jesus had preached. No, the presence of God, spending a moment with Jesus, encountering Jesus for a moment, can change everything in the way that we live out our lives. I'm thinking again about Nicodemus. Nicodemus, unlike Zacchaeus, was a very religious man. He was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. And in John 3, we see Nicodemus come for a backdoor encounter. Now, when you read John 3, you see that Nicodemus came by night to the back door where Jesus was staying because he'd heard Jesus. Something in his heart had stirred when he'd heard Jesus, and it was bigger than the religion he's been, he'd been serving. So at night, he comes to Jesus, and Jesus speaks to him about being born again. And in that moment, the life of Nicodemus, in that encounter, the life of Nicodemus, Nicodemus is radically changed. Why? Because suddenly in that moment, the religion that Nicodemus had about God was replaced with a a relationship with God. But also in that moment, his, his theology was corrected. You see, Nicodemus was living by an old covenant, an Old Testament theology that was based upon law, that was based upon a previous agreement that God had with man. In this moment, he met with God and God corrected his theology. I love it that sometimes when you meet religious people, you know, suddenly you see them more driven by the law and the things and Moses, and they miss the point that Jesus Christ has brought a new covenant into being, and it's a covenant based on relationship with him. You see, Nicodemus in that moment had his wrong theology corrected. An encounter with Jesus will always correct our wrong theology, the things that we're not believing correctly. Oh, how we need those moments with Jesus. I think of other examples. We read about the man called the demoniac, uh, the demoniac on the edge of the Gedarenes, that area, where we know that the Bible reveals that this man was helpless. He was tormented. He had a legion of devils in him. No one would help him. They isolated him to this random place so that he would be out of sight. But God always saw him and had freedom in mind for this man. And after coming through a storm, Jesus lands on the edge of the shore. Sure, you know the story, you can read about it in Luke 8. And all of a sudden, when Jesus turns up and this man filled with devils and demons encounters Jesus, every devil and demon in him said, we want to go into the pigs. We want to go into the pigs. So Jesus let them go into the pigs. They went over a cliff. The man was set free. You see, it's in an encounter with Jesus where freedom comes to our life. It's an encounter with Jesus that brings hopefulness to our life. This man, this poor man named the demoniac, was hopeless. He was helpless. He was tormented. But in a moment of an encounter with Jesus, he got freedom. He got set free. He was liberated. Now, the good news is this isn't just a man thing. Go through the different accounts in the Bible. I'm thinking of a woman caught in the act of adultery. Um, She was going to die. They dragged this woman out of a tent. You read about this in John chapter 8. Again, so many examples of people, everyday people that encountered Jesus. This poor woman had been caught in the act of adultery, which meant there were two people present in the crime that was taking place. The man was released. She was dragged out into the marketplace, fully embarrassed, thrown down at the, on the floor, actually to make a point to Jesus. The religious people wanted to make a point, and they used this poor woman to try and make the point. But what does Jesus do? He steps into that moment of encounter, and instead of allowing people to stone her to death, he releases freedom, and he releases forgiveness, and he releases future. In the hands of the religious, this woman had no future. She'd encountered religion. The consequence was she was going to die. But then suddenly she encounters Jesus. And Jesus, he turns around, he says, okay, I know the law you're trying to test me with. And he turns to the religious leaders and he said, absolutely correct. Let the person without sin throw the first stone. Imagine what that was like for that lady. She's on the floor waiting for the first stone to hit her. 
suddenly she hears people walking away. Why? Because religion in that moment encountered the God of grace, the, um, the maker of heaven and earth, the son of God, suddenly brought freedom, forgiveness and future to this woman. I love that. So many examples. You've got uh, Mary Magdalene. You could go through just the Gospels and just keep on picking out people. But staying with the theme of ladies, I'd like to talk now about one of my favorites, and I'm sure it's one of yours. And that's the encounter that Jesus had with a lady called a Samaritan. She's called a Samaritan woman. And we read about this account in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Now, I'm going to read through this passage of scripture today. I know a lot of the times when we turn to the word of God, we read sentences or a couple of statements. But I want to read this whole storyline because it paints the picture so beautifully itself of this lady encountering Jesus. So if you're watching today and you've got your Bibles with you, just turn to the book of the Gospel of John. And I'm going to start reading from chapter four and I'm going to pick up the storyline in verse four. OK, here we go. Now, speaking of Jesus, it says, Now he had, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired as he was on a journey, and he sat down by the well. It was about noon. It was 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Isn't that interesting? We've spoken previously of the encounter, the life-changing encounter that Jacob had with God that caused him to awaken to a new reality of who God was. Now we see Jesus sitting at the, the well of Jacob, as it was called, and he's sitting there, he's Thursday, he's thirsty, it's not Thursday, he's thirsty, it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon, it's noon. And then it says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Doesn't seem an unusual request, but it really was, and we'll look at that in a moment. His disciples had gone into the town to buy food, so he's alone at Jacob's well. This woman comes along who's a Samaritan, and he said, will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews did not associate with the Samaritans. Now, Jesus responds in verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. This must have intrigued her. What do you mean, living water? What do you mean, I should ask you? Who are you? These must have been the questions going through this lady's head. She didn't realize she was encountering God. She was encountering the Son of God. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is very, very deep. Where can you get this living water you're talking about? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as he did with his sons and his livestock? She's asking really honest questions, saying, you're talking about getting you water. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. You're talking about living waters. You're talking about giving me something greater than what my ancestors gave me. Jesus said, correct. Everyone who drinks from this water, natural water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give will become within them a well of life, a spring of water welling up even to eternal life. Now stay with me. Verse 15 shows us the response of this woman. The woman said, sir, give me this water that I won't get thirsty anymore. And uh, I don't have to come here anymore to be drawing water. She's still thinking natural water. She's thinking I've got to come here every day to get water. This guy's offering living water that will uh, be eternal, that will last forever. Me want some of that. He told her, this is interesting. He suddenly says, go call your husband and come back. Now we know later that Jesus was aware of her marital condition. But she answers with an honest heart. Always be honest when you have an encounter with Jesus. She says, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you've got five or you've had five husbands 
and the man you're currently with is not your husband. What you've said is very true. I love that, that he got an honest answer from this lady. I've known when I've had moments of encounter with Jesus and he's asked me something um, but needed an honest answer. There's always a blessing when you don't try to cover stuff up, but you just say, you know God, and you walk in a spirit of truth with him. Now, in verse 19, she then responds, Serve a woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. Uh, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship in Jerusalem. And this was one of the main divides between a Jew and a Samaritan was a place that a person should worship. Now, he responds, Jesus said, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain. Um, he said, you Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yeah, then he says, yet yeah, a time is coming and has now come when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, I want to finish up now with what it says in verse 25. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I am the one that you're speaking about. And very clearly he underlines, I am he. You've been taught that the Christ is coming. I'm here. I'm standing in front of you right now. I am the one that you have been believing to come. Right, this account is interesting because it shows us Jesus walking and ignoring the divides that men have put in place. Firstly, she should have been disqualified according to man because she was a Samaritan. There were issues between Samaritans and Jews. They, they had two different places that they believed they needed to worship. And they were, even though they'd come from the same family and lineage, they were now two different um, types of people. You had a Jew and you had a Samaritan. Jesus was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. Apparently, they shouldn't have been together. Also, she was a woman. Culturally, in that time, that was another barrier. He shouldn't really have been having this discourse with this woman. He shouldn't have been able, he shouldn't have been speaking to her because she was a Samaritan. But being a Samaritan woman was, again, according to the divides and the cultural um, barriers of that day, a double whammy of don't do this. But also, she was very much an outcast. Why? As Jesus had got her to explain or to um, own. She'd had five husbands and she was now on a man or she was now with a man that wasn't her husband. Now, you say to me, well, why was she an outcast? Well, a lot of those relationships probably would have involved adultery and divorce. And the actual fact that she was drawing water at noon meant that she was an outcast because actually the place called the Well or Jacob's Well was a place of fellowship. It was a place where the ladies would come together. It was a coffee morning place. It was a place of fellowship. But she couldn't come to the well when the other ladies came, maybe because of things that have happened with their husbands, men they knew, their sons, their, their, their uncles. She came alone. This lady was very much an outcast in society. But I love this. She wasn't an outcast to Jesus. You see, Jesus had seen this woman at the well and the encounter he was going to have with her long before she got up that morning to go and get the water. Jesus knew all about this lady and never went to judge her, but to bring her, a Samaritan, into the salvation that came with him as the bread of heaven, the waters of God. So I want to look at a couple of things here, because this is an amazing encounter. Imagine if this happened to you at a water fountain in a high street or maybe in a shopping center. Imagine, come on, let's earth this experience a little bit today. You're standing at a water fountain getting water. Suddenly you turn around and somebody says to you, get me a drink. And all of a sudden, that person begins to reveal everything about you and you know they don't know you. And suddenly they begin to tell you that they've got what you've been looking for. 
they've got everything that you've been on a life search for, that they can bring you a satisfaction that ticks every box that you've ever wanted ticked. That would be intriguing, wouldn't it? That's exactly what happened to this lady. All of a sudden, her attention is drawn to Jesus in this encounter. Now, all of a sudden, we see again Jesus operate outside of the divides of man. Man had said, this can't happen because she's a, Marit a Samaritan. Man said, this can't happen because she's a woman. Man had said, she can't, um, this can't happen because of um, the legacy of relationship in her life. This woman is an outcast. She's a woman. She's a Samaritan. And I love it that Jesus is so blind to all of these things. Why? Because Jesus came that every person could be saved. Jesus came that every person could enjoy an encounter with him. Jesus came to tear down the divides that were put in place by man, to save everyone, to become the bread of life to everyone that was hungry, to become the waters of living water to everyone who had a thirst, including you and me. The other thing I love about this story is Jesus offers satisfaction. Now, she was at the water drawing, she was at the well, sorry, drawing natural water for natural thirst. But the reality was her, her life represented a lot of other thirst. The reason that she had probably gone through so many relationships was that there was a discontent thirst in her relationally. Suddenly Jesus said a relationship with God will take away what broken systems or other relationships have not been able to satisfy. I don't know the other things in her world that lacked satisfaction, but all I know is Jesus said, if you come and drink of the water that I provide, you will be satisfied. I love that, that throughout the Gospels, throughout Scripture, you see Jesus saying to the hungry, come to me and I'll take away your hunger. Come to me, to the thirsty, and I will not just quench your thirst, but I'll cause rivers of refreshing to flow out of you. The good news is that this wasn't just an encounter for a woman over 2,000 years ago at a well called Jacob's Well. This is the same Jesus that says to us, come and encounter me. This is the same Jesus that, said, that says, bring all your hunger to me, bring all your thirst to me. And just because I'm not walking the earth, it doesn't mean that I can't satisfy your every need. This woman physically met Jesus in this moment. But Jesus Christ is here today for us to spiritually encounter as well, in no lesser deal. In fact, when we encounter Jesus today, we encounter the risen Jesus. You see, this lady encountered Jesus before he died, been buried, rose from the dead and ascended. When we encounter Jesus today, it's not a lesser Jesus. We get to encounter the risen, ascended Christ to whom nothing is impossible. The last thing I want to draw out of this story, this moment of encounter, is that this encounter that this lady had with Jesus revolutionized her life to the degree that the very next thing you see her do, and if you read on in the chapters, if you read on in, in John 4, you see she runs down to the city or the town or the village and tells everyone about this man that she's met called Jesus. Now, her life is so impacted by her encounter with Jesus, she can't keep it to herself. It says she runs down to the local area where all the people were and just began to tell everyone. And everyone began to say, we want to come and meet this man you're speaking about. She went from being someone that was an outcast to being someone that was straight away an incredible an evangelist, a soul winner, somebody that went and got everyone that she knew and brought them to meet Jesus also. I love it in this story that the disciples had been oblivious to what was happening. 
And as she's gone down and told everyone about Jesus, that she'd met the Messiah, she'd met the Son of God, she'd met the Christ, they're bringing back food thinking that he needs a snack. Then all of a sudden, they look behind them and they see crowds of people coming to meet Jesus. They hadn't created the crowds. This woman, this outcast previously, this Samaritan that apparently Jesus shouldn't have spoken to, had gone and shared with others the impact of her encounter with Christ. Now people were following her footsteps to meet him also. I love this. I want to encourage you today. Read through the Gospels. See the incredible encounters that people had. Like I said, Nicodemus, Zacchaeus, each of the disciples in that moment when they encountered Jesus and he said to them, come and follow me and I will make you. What makes a person leave their family business of fishing, leave being a tax man for Luke, leave being a doctor? It wasn't religion about God. It was because in a moment they had an encounter with God, an encounter that shook everything they believed, that touched their heart in a way nothing else had touched their heart. For this Samaritan woman, somebody that had brought satisfaction, Jesus brought satisfaction where no other thing could satisfy her. He's the same Jesus. He's the same God. He still steps into our world today and steps in to change everything. You see, like I said at the beginning, it's an encounter with Jesus that changes everything in our life. This week, why don't you take time to keep on coming into his presence? We call that prayer. Come in with a hungry heart that says, God, I want to encounter you in a fresh way. I believe that that's the sort of prayer that God will always answer. The Lord bless you. See you next week.